talking about um, principal series representations, which are um, representations that are very important in harmonic analysis on semi-simple Lie groups. And I'm going to be talking about the, a, a, um, uh, a, a new way to possibly extend this definition to direct limit groups. So first I'll mention what is a direct limit group. So if we start with a, for instance, an increasing chain of Lie groups, um, G sub n, for where n is an integer. And um, G sub n is a subgroup of G sub n. If n is, a, is less than or equal to m. And then we take uh, the union of all the GNs. We get a new group. Um, and we can give this group the direct limit topology, which is very simple. This subset is open if and only if it's intersection with each finite dimensional or, or each, uh, each subgroup G sub n is open. So uh, an example of this, of this sort of construction would be if you take um, the groups SLN. Well, SLN is always a subgroup of SLN plus 1. And one way of embedding SLN as a subgroup of SLN plus 1 is to take when you're, you're in by n matrix A and construct an n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix where you stick A up here in the upper left-hand corner, a 1 down here in the lower right-hand corner, and zeros here and here. Okay, um, and, then, and then you can take the direct limit of these groups and you get a, an infinite dimensional group called SL infinity. And you can do this same trick with basically any of the classical linear groups. So there is a group SO infinity, SU infinity, etc., etc. Okay, so why should you be interested in these groups? Well, for one reason, one, one reason is that these are sort of the smallest dimensional Lie groups that you can construct, right? Um, they have countable dimension, um, and, and they're sort of built out of finite dimensional things. So uh, they sort of um, inherit a lot of properties of finite dimensional Lie groups, and they are they just sort of just begin to show the pathologies of infinite dimensional Lie groups. There's, there's sort of this in-between case in some sense. I, I, I have this sense that they should somehow be useful in, in physical applications for modeling systems with infinitely many degrees of freedom. Um, of course, one problem with any infinite dimensional Lie group is that there's no Haar measure, right? Because Haar measures exist if and only if you have a locally compact group, and infinite dimensional groups are not locally compact. So they can't have Haar measures. They never do. Uh, so if you want to do, you can always consider representations of these groups because they're topological groups, and you can consider unitary representations of any topological group. It's a question you can ask. But the basic questions for harmonic analysis, you sort of can't ask in the same way because you don't have a bar measure. So you need a, a, a correct context for, for that. Um, and um, so, so, so one thing you might hope is that uh, maybe if you could come up with the correct context for harmonic analysis, then maybe you'd get some representations that would be analogous to the representations that show up in harmonic analysis for the corresponding finite dimensional Lie groups. So in the case of semi-simple Lie groups, you'd hope for things like uh, principal series representations. Well, complementary series representations aren't so important for harmonic analysis, but actually uh, um, uh, they were, they're, they're sort of the impetus behind this particular project I'm going to be reporting on today. Um, because we were trying to do um, something called reflection positivity for direct limit groups is how this project got started. And um, without going into the details, you end up with this connection between discrete series representations of certain groups and complementary series representations of other groups. So we wanted to construct complementary series representations um, in, an, in an infinite dimensional context. And I should, I should mention this is uh, joint work with uh, my former advisor, Gester Olofsson, um, Stéphane Marigon, who has since left mathematics, um, and uh, Sean Taylor. Um, Let's see here. So, so let's re review what uh, what uh, let's review the definition of of uh, of principal series representations in the in the classical finite dimensional context. We're going to restrict ourselves to just the unitary spherical principal series for this talk. So let's go ahead and start with a non-compact semi-simple linear Lie group with uh, without well without compact factors um, and we'll pick a parabolic subgroup. It doesn't have to be a minimal parabolic. In fact, for us today, it'll be the maximal parabolic that's most interesting. Um, parabolic subgroups always have this decomposition uh, 
this Langlands decomposition m times a times n, where a here is an abelian group, n is nilpotent, and uh, and and this group m is chosen in such a way that um, m times a is the centralizer of a. Now, in the case of the minimal parabolic, m is actually uh, um, compact, but for any of the other parabolics, it's no longer it's no longer going to be compact. Okay. So uh, it turns out that G admits everything in G can be written as a product of something in K, something in M, something in H, something in N. And, and really, I should, be, I should put little labels on M, A, and N because they depend on the parabolic that I choose. Um, and then I can consider the, the homogeneous space G mod P, which is a flag manifold. And um, because of this decomposition, you can think of G mod P as uh, it's, it's diffeomorphic to this other homogeneous space where, where K is acting, where K is the symmetry group, um, K mod K intersect M. And the diffeomorphism is given by just take anything, take anything in G mod P. So here I've written G times P, where G is something in the group G. And then I just send it to K of G, where um, G, the representative in uh, the representative for this element of G mod P, can be written as K of G times M times A times N. And then I just send it to whatever corresponds to K of G over here. Okay, and um, and this of course gives me a way to transfer the action of G on G mod P to an action of G on this space. Um, so, so, so uh, to define the principal series representation, uh, we're going to be inducing representation of P to a representation of G. To do this, you need to consider um, uh, uh, sections of, 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 of certain vector bundles over G mod P. And uh, here we are going to get into the, the me actual measure theory is important. So we need to consider L2 sections. And although G mod P doesn't have a G invariant measure because P is actually not a unimodular group. It does have a K invariant measure because G mod P is just the same thing as this this compact homogeneous space as a as a as a as a as a K as a space where K acts. So it automatically has a K invariant measure, and that measure is quasi invariant under G. So if you act with G, you get um, you get uh, a Jacobian which comes out, and that gives you a radon nicotine derivative for this K invariant measure mu. Um, shifted by an element of G. So, so that gives you this co-cycle, this, this function rho, which is a function of, of, of an element of, of G, uh, which acts on G mod P, and then an element of G mod P. Okay, and in fact, you can say exactly what it is in this case. In terms of representation theory data, this rho is actually half the sum of the positive restricted roots <coughs> which come from the root system associated with, with this parabolic. Um, OK, so how do you construct the, the unitary spherical principle series representations? So I said that this group A was an abelian Lie group. So you consider its Lie algebra, fractor A, and its complex, the complexification of that Lie algebra. And then lambda is something in the dual vector space. So it's a functional on, on the complexification of A. Um, and then. What I'm going to do is define a representation of P by, uh, by separately considering representations of M, A, and N and putting them together. So in this case, I'm going to use a trivial representation of N. I use this weight on the Lie algebra A to define a, a representation of this abelian Lie group A. So this, this lambda gives me a weight on the Lie algebra of A, which then on the exponential map gives me a representation of the group. And then, because I'm interested in the spherical principle series for this talk, um, uh, among other things, it makes things more, uh, more simple. Um, I'm going to just start with, I'm just going to consider the trivial representation of M. So you put all these together, and this gives you a, 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 the defi a definition of a, of a one-dimensional representation of, of this parabolic group, M times A times N. And again, all I'm really doing is basically, uh, uh, taking this weight on A and exponentiating it. Okay. So 
so then I can take this representation and induce it from the parabolic subgroup up to G. And again, since L2 of G, and essentially what's happening here is because I'm starting with the trivial representation of M, the, the vector bundle I get is trivial. So I can think of this as a space of functions. And because I'm using a one-dimensional representation of B, they are, they are uh, functions to, to, to just the complex numbers. So, they, so, so the, the space it acts on is L2 of G mod P, which is the same thing as L2 of K mod K intersect M. And uh, it basically, so, so it, it, acts, it acts almost like translation, right? You act on a function here almost by translating it. So first of all, what's going on here, this K of G inverse X is basically saying, I act by translation, but if I'm translating by something in G, I need to, uh, I need to tr use the action of G on this space. So that's why I've written K of G inverse X, which is giving, giving me the action of G on, on this space. Um, then this here is uh, uh, f the radon nicotine derivative, which I put in so that I can actually uh, get unitary representation. So this is basically taking out the, uh, the effect of that translation has on the measure, right? Because it's only K invariant. So if I were to act by something in K, I would just get F of K inverse X. Um, <coughs> and then because I'm inducing from this representation of A, uh, that's where this, this A factor comes in. Okay. And, 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 and given the, the formula that you can write down for rho, you can actually rewrite this as um, in, in terms of a, a, just a power of A where this is, again, half the sum of the positive roots. Okay. And this is a spherical representation in the sense that it has a k invariant vector. And that's simply because I can consider the constant functions, right? And those are k invariant because k acts just by translation. Okay. <coughs> also, it's, it's unitary if I put in lambda purely imaginary because here, um, so this takes out the, 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 the effect that translation has on the measure. And here, if I raise this to an imaginary power, well, that's just um, e to an imaginary number up here. And that's, that's not going to, uh, so I get a unitary representation in that case. Sometimes I can put in, in not just a purely imaginary number, but a, but a real number, and I'll get something unitary. And when you can do that, you get essentially a complementary series of representation. But I won't get into the details because that's still a little bit uh, messy. And and uh, and in general, when you're doing this principal series representation, almost always you get an irreducible representation of G. Okay, so uh, what we, what we'd like to do is come up with something similar for infinite dimensional groups for direct limit groups. Of course, the the um, one thing you'd think. That, that might work is, so it's, it, it's true that if you take a direct limit of irreducible representations, then you wind of, 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 of groups that fit into a direct system, then the direct limit representation is irreducible, right? So one natural way of constructing irreducible principal series representations, you might think is, well, let's just take a direct limit of principal series representations. Okay, so there are a couple of problems with that, as we'll see. Or you might say, well, let's just use this induction construction and just induce from a parabolic subgroup up to the big group. Again, one problem with that is that we had to talk about measures. And here, the quotient space, the, the flag manifold will be infinite dimensional. Okay, so for the moment, we'll just look at the details for the maximum parabolics for SLNR, because that's the example that we're going to see worked out in detail today. <coughs> So basically, in general, if you take a, the minimal parabolic subgroup for SLNR, you get the upper triangular matrices. And if you want to consider, so that corresponds to the flag manifold where you have full flags. And if you want to consider other parabolic subgroups, you put um, things that are upper block diagonal with blocks of different sizes. And then if you consider um, the biggest blocks, right, the ex other extreme is if you have just two blocks. So, so that corresponds to this case where, uh, where I, uh, so if you want to consider a maximal parabolic for SLNR, then one way to do that is to fix 
um, some number p, some number n greater than or equal to p, and then I'll just for notational convenience, q is n minus p. Okay, so these, so now I SLN is p plus q, and I can consider matrices in SLN as as having uh, a two by block structure. And in this case, uh, the the A subgroup is essentially going to be um, uh, matrices that are some multiple of the identity on this block and some multiple of the identity in this block. And the trace has to be zero if I'm looking at the, the Lie algebra because um, it has to be inside the Lie algebra of SLNR. Okay, so I've gone ahead and uh, uh, written Q times IP and minus P times IQ because if you take the trace of that, you get zero. And then all mul constant multiples of, of that of that matrix. Okay, and then the 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 if you want to include the M part in this, so the Levy factor, you just need the centralizer of that one-dimensional Lie algebra. And 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 if you do that, you get precisely these block diagonal matrices. Where here I can have any p by p matrix. Here I can have any q by q matrix, and the only restriction is that the sum of the traces has to be zero. And then the n part is basically uh, the strictly upper triangular n block structure matrices. So here I have zero in this p by p block, and zero in this q by q block, zero in this um, q by p block, and here I have whatever I want. <laughs> and you can check uh, that these um, all commute with each other. Okay, so then I put this all together and I get this Maxwell parabolic. On the group level, I, this is what I get. This group turns out to actually be a billion, and this product is just the sum of the, uh, it's just the, the vector space sum here. Um, uh, yes, so, so, um, so yeah, so A here it exponentiates to this uh, group where uh, of all the matrices which are multiples of the identity on this block and on this block such that the determinant is one. I put them all together, I get the parabolic subgroup, Maxwell parabolic subgroup. Okay, so what you get when you consider the flag manifold in this case is actually a Grassmannian, right? Um, and this is a special case because this is actually a symmetric space, it's a compact symmetric space. So in particular, if I consider just the action of uh, of SON on L2 of this space, that's a very simple thing to decompose. I get just the spherical representations. I know exactly what those are. Um, okay, so this should be a very nice context for, for, for constructing these, uh, uh, for, 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 for constructing an infinite dimensional analog uh, of this context. And notice that I've been labeling everything by a little subscript in corresponding to, um, uh, so this, uh, so I'm starting with subgroups of SLN, and that's because I'm going to take direct limits. I can just go ahead and do that. So th I'm going to define this parabolic subgroup P infinity as just a direct limit of L infinity times N infinity, where L infinity is just a direct limit of the LNs, just a union of all the LNs. N sub infinity is just a union of all the, of all the N sub Ns. It doesn't sound uh, doesn't sound too uh, doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Here's a minor difficulty: a sub n is not actually a subgroup of a sub n plus one. And if you if you look at the definition here, you'll see why. Because uh, um, you might uh, um, you might say, well, let's just um, add on ones here, like we did before. But the problem is, then you no longer get something in this group where you have constant times the identity matrix here and constant times the identity matrix here. Okay. And in fact, this, is the, this observation is the key to making this whole construction work. Because once you realize this, you say, well, let's just forget about the group A. Let's focus entirely on the Levy factor L, which is the product of M and A. Well, there's no problem here, right? L infinity is just, uh, is just you can think of them as um, infinite matrices, where I've got this p by p block up here, which is in GLP. I've got something here, which is in the direct limit of GLNs, and then the product of the determinants is one. Now, GL infinity consists of just matrices which have which differ by the from by, by the from the identity by uh, a finite rank 
uh, operator. And so the determinant of B is well defined. Okay. And then in, in infinity is, is precisely uh, this space. Okay. Okay, so, so, so now we can go ahead and define our one-dimensional representation of P infinity that we use for the induction. Um, we can just take the absolute value, the determinant of, of this P by P part A up here, and raise it to some power lambda. Okay? And somehow, if we choose a purely imaginary complex number, we expect to get something unitary out of this. So we need to define the induction. The problem is that this doesn't have any quasi-invariant measure. So I've already mentioned that infinite dimensional groups don't have harm measures. And, and, and it shouldn't be a leap from there to, to conclude that it should be difficult, if not impossible, to get invariant measures on infinite dimensional homogeneous spaces. And that's correct. You can't even get quasi-invariant measures. Um, so it sounds hopeless. Uh, so there are a couple of ways around this. One way, very nice construction. Um, so, so by the way, I should mention that Joe Wolf has a really nice series of papers where, uh, where the, the sort of general classification of parabolic subgroups in direct in the in the context of direct limit groups and parabolic subalgebras is uh, is considered, and and then also uh, where 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 a possible analog of principal series representations is constructed. And um, and uh, um, one way around this is use an invariant mean, okay? Because uh, uh, SO infinity is uh, has ha is an amenable group, so maybe you can use an SO infinity invariant mean on this, and then that should give you an L uh, something like an L two space. So invariant means are things which are sort of like poor man's measures. They are. Um, uh, instead of being thing elements of the dual of the compactly supported continuous functions, they are elements of the dual of the bounded uniformly continuous functions. The problem is that when they exist, they're not unique. In fact, if a group is amenable in general, the cardinality of the set of all invariant means is two to the two to the order of the group. So it's uh, the non-uniqueness is as bad as it could possibly be. And to prove that it exists, you need the axiom of choice. Now. This is not as bad as it sounds, because oftentimes you can prove that something holds true for all the invariant means. And it turns out to be something analogous to what happens in, in the classical context of harmonic analysis. But nevertheless, it might be nice to get an actual measure space, where there's an actual group acting on a, um, on a measure space, and you're actually considering honest-to-goodness L2 functions on some measure space. So uh, it turns out that uh, Doug Pickrell has an old paper from the mid-80s um, where uh, just such a construction is done for the complex Grossmannians, but it works for the real Grossmannians just as well, um, where instead of considering this space, you need to consider a certain uh, extension of this space to something bigger, which does have a measure on it, which is invariant under SO infinity. So it's no longer a homogeneous space, it's something like a homogeneous space which has been thickened out in some sense. Okay, so how is this defined? We start with the Grassmannian of P planes in R in. Okay. Um, so this is all, 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 P sub, all P planes of in R in. So here SL in acts naturally um, on this space just by, well, it, it, you take some subspace, some P dimensional subspace and act on it with something in SLN that gives you another p-dimensional subspace. OK. So you act point by point at each, every element of the uh, vector subspace. Now, it turns out that we do have a projection from Rn plus 1 to Rn, right? where we just forget about the last coordinate. OK? So it turns out you can define a projection from the Grassmannian of p-planes in Rn plus 1, the Grassmannian of p-planes in Rn, by just saying, OK, if I have uh, some p-plane in Rn plus 1, I'll just take that p-plane and I'll project it using this projection. I'll take the image of that plane under this projection. And that will give me a subspace of Rn. OK. Now, you should be complaining that that won't always give me, sorry, that won't always give me a p-dimensional uh, subspace of Rn. But if it does, then I'm golden, right? And 
And since we really only care about measure spaces, and since the, the, the case where that doesn't happen is measure zero, we can just um, define some default value in this measure zero subset. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then we have a, a, a measurable projection, which is continuous almost everywhere, except for on this sort of bad set, this singular set. Right. OK, so this is actually, this map is actually SLN equivariant. So in other words, if I act on something up here, but something SLN, not an SLN plus one, but something SLN that only acts on the first N coordinates, and then project, that's the same thing as if I first project and then act by something in SLN. Because it's not doing anything. SLN doesn't do anything to that last coordinate. OK, so this is SLN equivariant almost everywhere. Ignoring this set of measure 0 that's problematic, we have an equivariant map. OK. Um, and then you can consider the projective limit of these measure spaces. OK, so instead of constructing an inductive limit of spaces, here we have a projective limit. And uh, not of topological spaces, because these aren't continuous maps, but as of measure OK. Each of these spaces has an, a unique SON invariant probability measure. And because I just told you that these are equivariant maps, it has to project the SON plus 1 invariant probability measure up here to an SON invariant probability measure down here. So if everything is normalized, we have to move from the invariant probability measure up here to the, the invariant probability measure down here. OK, so then we have a projective system of invariant measures. And by Kolmogorov's theorem, you can, can, can take, you can construct a projective limit measure, which is a probability measure, on this big space. Okay? And this is a big space on which SO, the group SO infinity acts. And this measure is going to be invariant under this group SO infinity. Um, and furthermore, the, S, the L2 space of this, uh, this big measure space is just a completion of, a, of an inductive limit of the L2 spaces of the finite dimensional spaces. Okay. This, this bar here can, stands for Hilbert space completion, and this bar here is uh, uh, indicating that we're constructing the projective, not the inductive limit. Okay, so uh, the important thing is that this can be done in such a way that we not only have a measure here that is SO infinity invariant, because you can always already see that in the paper of Pickrell, at least for the complex Grassmannians, but it all works, or the real Grassmannians. The important thing is that the measure here is, because this is like the flag manifold, Right? So it needs to not just have a k invariant measure, but a g quasi invariant measure. In this case, g is SLN. So the measure needs to be quasi invariant under the action of this big group SL infinity. Now, this is trickier because now we're acting with a direct limit of non compact semi simple E groups. So it's a little bit more of a stretch to ask for it to still be quasi invariant in the direct limit because it's not even an amenable group. Um, but it turns out that, that, that it works out. So one, one, one thing is that you notice that, this, that, the, that if you consider all the linear maps from Rp to Rn, so in other words, P by N matrices, that gives you a GLN principal bundle over the Grassmannian. OK. So, uh, so, so and the projection is just literally the, taking the image of the linear map from Rp to Rn. And that gives you a p-dimensional subspace. Uh, so these are, uh, I should say, sorry, th these are rank P matrices. Sorry, that's, I should, that's a typo. I should have said rank P matrices. Um, okay, so this map is uh, equivariant under the action of SLN on the left. Um, and then this big space also has an action of GLP on the right. right? It's, a, it's a GLP principal bundle. Okay, the projections... There's, there's, the projections that I just mentioned on the level of Grassmannians are easy to describe on the level of these matrices. I just lop off the lower rows, right? I'm, so in other words, I'm forgetting what, the, what this information tells me about the image on the, on the last coordinate. Okay, so this, is, this projection is easy to write down. So if I start with Lebesgue measure on, um, on, this, on this space, I can construct the Gaussian measure. Um, I can construct a Gaussian measure which is actually invariant under SON. OK? Um, and I can do this at each level. And I can do this in such a way that, uh, that I have a projective system of measures. 
on, on m p n. So I do the same trick, and I get in the projective limit of these m p n's another measure which is in, uh, invariant under s o infinity. Okay. And uh, using Kolmogorov's theorem. Um, and here, it's much easier to work out what the, uh, to, 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 to prove the quasi invariance of SL infinity. I don't think we have time to get into the details. And the reason is because, uh, well, it's, it's just a matter of, 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 of sitting with this explicit formula and writing out the rate on Nicodem derivative. You know that on each finite dimensional level, it's quasi invariant. Because quasi-invariance just means that it that you have a measure which is locally Lebesgue, and it's certainly the case here. Um, and then what you do is you show that the rate on Nicodem derivatives are cylindrical functions on on this projective system, which means that they that 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 you get a measure which is quasi-invariant in the limit. Um, so then you can uh, uh, you can write down explicitly what it is, but uh, but once you have that, then you can then define a representation by taking this radon nicotine derivative, taking the square root of it, and then, um, so if I put a, a lambda purely imaginary here, I get a unitary representation. Okay, and that is what I'm saying is a candidate for a unitary spherical principle series representation. The point is that because it turns out that you can show that this is actually a direct limit of spherical representations, because the L2 of this, of this projective limit space is a direct limit of L2 spaces at each level. And because the, the radon nicotine derivative of the action of SL infinity is uh, a cylindrical function, that tells you that this has to be irreducible almost everywhere because you're taking a direct limit of irreducible representations. Uh, it's spherical because I can just consider constant functions on, on this uh, projective limit of Grassmannians. Right? And so if I act with something in k infinity, which in this case, sorry, is SO infinity, then it stays constant. And it's unitary if I choose something in purely imaginary. Um, something, a similar construction works for the finite rank parabolic subgroups. And it seems like it should work in general for all of those. Um, okay, so what are we working on right now? This is actually still a work in progress. We're working on explicitly describing the k types of this representation. In principle, it should just be a direct sum of, because I because the because we actually have a symmetric space, a direct limit of symmetric spaces here, in the case of the Grassmannians, um, it should just be a direct sum of all of the spherical representations for this uh, direct limit of symmetric spaces, which we've already classified um, in earlier work. So that should be that's that's the expectation, but um, 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 but weird things happen. Um, and and uh, similar work on in in another context uh, by by Olshansky and Borodin went in a completely different direction, where you wound up with uh, um, point processes that correspond to log gas distributions, things that had no correspondent, uh, no equivalent, uh, no equivalent. Um, uh, they, they didn't seem to correspond to anything in classical harmonic analysis. But there are reason to suspect, there's reason to suspect that it should be simpler in this case. Uh, again, the impetus behind this was originally trying to construct a complementary series representation, so we'd like to do that. Can you do something similar for minimal parabolic subgroups? This construction seems to be breaking down, but there may be another way to fix it. And one thing that I'm particularly interested in is uh, if you construct an SL infinity quasi-invariant measure on something like a projective limit of these Riemannian symmetric spaces. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. And, and happy birthday to Adolfo. I would, I would sing Las Mañanitas, but I don't want to torture everyone before lunch. <laughs> Yes, and it, um, and we uh, we've 
we've already considered that, um, and it's so. So basically, the the reason for, for considering this particular context that I mentioned today was starting from that more general context, exactly of those symmetric R spaces, and we were looking at um, uh, the canonical representations. And, um, and, and trying to sort of generalize that from the finite dimensional context to the infinite dimensional context. So, so, so what you're saying is correct, and it seems like if you start with that context and then look at the direct limit case, it seems like all of this should work out. But again, I, I don't think we've worked out all the details except for in this particular case. Does that help answer your question? Yes. Any other questions? You said that uh -huh. Yes. In this particular example, so there are other examples uh, of direct limits of symmetric spaces where, so Borodin and Olshansky, for instance, considered the groups U of N. And of course, U of N is a symmetric space, right? It's U of N cross U of N mod diagonal. Okay, and there's it turns out that there you so these this is a, a these are symmetric spaces with this as the symmetry group. It turns out that there's a way to construct a projection from u n plus one to u n almost everywhere, which is continuous almost everywhere, exactly in the same sense that we just discussed here for the Grassmannians, so where it's actually equivariant. Um, this map is equivariant under the action of u n cross u n, u n on the left and u n on the right. Okay, then you. You, you, you put harm measures on each of these, consider the projective limit, you get something in the projective limit, which is, you get a measure on the projective limit of these, which is invariant under the action of U infinity. And uh, this is, uh, this, this ended up being a, a series of two or three long papers with lots of details by uh, Olshansky and Borodin, where they worked out all the details of the, de the decomposition of that representation. They called it harmonic analysis on the infinite dimensional unitary group because it's, it's in some sense an analog of decomposing the bi-regular representation of UN. And it turns out that it's very difficult. At each level, you know exactly what the representations are, right? By Peter Weil and highest weight theory. And what you essentially need to do is look at the, the, the combinatorical data of each representation up here gets sent to a UN representation up here, but it's sort of split among, among different UN plus one representations. And you sort of need to know what's the inner product, in some sense, among each of the components up here, and then look at asymptotics of this combinatorical data. And you wind up considering, uh, you wind up with, uh, uh, there's lots of probability theory, and actually point processes come into play. And this is where this uh, log gas distribution I was mentioning came up. But there's, so this is the only case that I know of in the literature where the details have been worked out. Um, in this case, I can't find it. Somebody once told me that Olshansky and all of them know the answer and worked it out, but it's nowhere in the literature. And, um, and so, uh, but there's reason to hope that it should be simpler in that case. 